we are thinking about phishing, malware, botnets, um, and spam when used as a delivery mechanism for those other types of abuse. Um, I put a few definitions on the screen in case people aren't familiar. Phishing is, is around um, attempting to collect sensitive information or important per personal information um, through a means of deception. Malware is about software that has a malicious purpose and botnets are a, a connected group of devices or networks that are being controlled um, for malicious purposes. And spam is unsolicited email. It can often be used uh, in combination with those other types of abuse. So uh, I talked a little bit about this distinction between malicious and compromised, and that is quite an important one to, to draw out. Um, so a malicious domain registration is one that has been registered for the purposes of conducting that harm. A compromised one is one that is benign or, you know, it's otherwise registered for a legitimate purpose, but it's been compromised in some way and used for a malicious purpose. This is really important for mitigation. Um, the point I was talking about earlier around uh, collateral damage, but also that there is potentially a victim at the heart of that domain registration in terms of the registrant who may not know that their domain is being used for this purpose. Um, and so roughly around 25 to 45% of all um, phishing and malware come from compromised uh, websites. So it's, it's a really important piece of that puzzle when we're thinking about mitigation and what action should take place and by who. Okay, so I am going to focus now on two of our key initiatives at the Institute. So the first one is NetBeacon. Um, NetBeacon is designed to address two problems. The first is that reporting abuse on the internet is really hard. It requires a certain amount of technical knowledge. There's no consistent standards. It's, um, it's not really something that is scalable to the size of the internet. So it's tricky for reporters. The second part of the problem is on the other side. So people who receive the reports, um, often registrars, they don't always get reports that are for them. Some of them are unevidenced. Not, some of them are unactionable or don't contain all the information that they need to make a decision. Um, so the re those are the reasons that we put together NetBeacon um, to design a, a centralized place for abuse reporting that is easy to use and automatically routes those reports in a standardized format to registrars. So important to note, um, NetBeacon is free. It's free for registrars, it's free for reporters. Everything that we do is openly accessible. It allows anybody who finds an issue of um, phishing, malware, botnets or spam to access the portal put in the evidence that is needed, and then that report will automatically be sent to the correct registrar to action. So the reporter doesn't need to look up where to send that, navigate a specific um, process for each different registrar. We do that hard work of addressing the report for you. And on the registrar side, um, they'll receive reports automatically, but if they make an account, they can also um, access more functionality around standardized, um, sorry, not standardizing, around customizing how they receive those reports, where they go, and uh, also select which enrichments they like. So when we receive a report, we cross-reference that with some other databases that, uh, that give information and context to that report, so they can choose which ones they want to apply. And I should say that um, NetBeacon was developed uh, with support from uh, Clean DNS, who provided the development work for producing this tool. <clears throat> so, other features. Um, there's an API that can be used to, again, speed up this process. Uh, you can, registrars can embed this uh, form on their website. Um, important to note what NetBeacon is not. So, it's not an abuse management tool. It doesn't make determinations of what should happen. Um, we don't store reports permanently. This is about getting the information to the right place. Um, and it doesn't provide access to like personal information for registrants or for customers. 
some of the things we're thinking about for the future. We'd love to expand uh, the harms that are covered. We'd love to integrate other um, technical operators. So moving beyond registrars and registries into hosting and other providers. We still need to integrate country code, top level domains. Uh, at the moment, this is around GTLDs, so generic top level domains. And we'd love to do more around reporter reputation, as that's an area that is, is very interesting and there's a lot of uh, desire to, to understand which reporters are consistently submitting uh, well evidence reports. So the, the second initiative uh, that we have is uh, called DNSAI Compass. So this one is all about measuring DNS abuse. We have this mission to reduce DNS abuse at the Institute, and it's really hard to know if we, we've done that, if we don't have a, a sufficiently um, robust way of measuring that over time. So what we did here was partner with a external academic um, called Marce Koninsky, who works out of Grenoble University in France. Um, he's done a lot of work in this space, and we, we basically briefed him to find the best possible way he could to measure DNS abuse. Um, and we wanted the, that measurement to include evidence of the abuse. Um, and we had certain principles that we wanted to see followed through in this project. So one is around transparency, one's around credibility and independence, and the other is around accuracy and reliability. So part of the, uh, the work that we did to ensure transparency was that we published a very detailed methodology, which you can see a bit of a, a screenshot of on the screen there. Um, that's available on our website at that link, so you can uh, go through and see exactly how we're getting to the numbers that we're getting. Some things to note up front is that we have optimised for accuracy, so evidence collection was really important. We're not trying to measure everything bad that happens on the internet, but we're trying to have a really robust way of measuring um, the things that we think we can measure consistently and reliably over time. We're also looking at whether mitigation has occurred, and we're also looking at how many of the domains that we find are compromised or malicious. So to give you a bit of a sense of the, the data that we're seeing come in, this is all freely available on our website. These charts are interactive. Um, what you're, you're looking at here is a count of the unique domain names that our methodology has identified are involved in phishing or malware. So this project focuses at the moment just on phishing and malware because that's where we felt that there was sufficient evidence and a robust methodology that we could implement. But we are considering um, whether we include other harms in this in the future. So uh, initially, you can see here that phishing is in much greater numbers than malware. And this is something that we were expecting. This is consistent with other attempts to measure phishing and malware. And one thing to note about our reporting is that we count unique domain names rather than URLs. So we're not trying to count harm. We're trying to count um, how many unique domains are included, uh, are identified as being involved in phishing and malware. And one of the reasons for that is because we're coming from the registrar and registry perspective of what they can do about that harm. And from their perspective, there's just one domain name that they can either take action on or not. So that's why we're not counting um, URLs and we're not trying to estimate total harm. Um, this next chart is one that focuses on mitigation. Um, so the, the green uh, bar that you're seeing there is when our methodology has identified that some mitigation has happened. So that means that we believe that the harm has stopped. We're not uh, distinguishing exactly why it stopped or who has taken action, but it means that we think the harm has, has ceased. It could be that the registrar took action. It could be the registrant, the registry. It might even be that the person using the domain name for a malicious purpose has kind of stopped using it. They've done what they, they intended to do and disabled the domain name. But it's starting to give us a sense of how many of those unique domain names that we identify are being mitigated. Um, there's also a, a category for not mitigated. That means 
that according to our methodology, we believe the harm has not been mitigated um, for the period of measurement. And that period of measurement is up to 30 days after um, the domain name is identified. So we, I suppose we could check this uh, continuously, but we had to sort of, for practical purposes, put a deadline on um, how, how uh, long we would go back to visiting that domain name and checking whether any mitigation has occurred. And the, the time that we chose was 30 days. So that's another reason why our reporting tends to be a little bit delayed because we have a domain appear um, in, within our methodology. Uh, we go back at very small intervals initially of minutes and then we extend out to 12 hours up to 30 days. So if something comes on to our list at the end of um, say July, we still then need the month after that to check. Um, we also have this category of uncategorized um, and this is something that we included also in pursuit of our transparency principle. We wanted to be really clear about areas where we weren't able to determine either way whether we thought that the domain had been um, mitigated or not mitigated. And there is some text in our methodology that, that provides some uh, reasons why we think that might be. Um, and we also have an unprocessed category, which is, is relatively small, but that is um, due to things like server errors and technical access. Okay, so this next chart is looking at the speed of mitigation. So this one is slightly different in terms of how it's structured because it's measuring a count of registrars. So uh, we don't know for sure who took action, but what it indicates here when we allocate domains to a registrar is that the domain is under their management. So here we're counting how many registrars have a median mitigation time within each of these buckets. So 0 to 24, 24 to 48, 48 to 7, and then more than 7, up to 30 days when our um, mitigation measurement stops. So this, uh, this is just trying to give a sense of how quickly mitigation is happening. There isn't an industry standard to this, uh, but generally um, we're trying to understand you know, what, what is happening, how quick it's happening, and how that varies across the industry. And then finally, this is looking at uh, this distinction between malicious and compromised. Um, all of these charts you can toggle between phishing and malware. I split them up here because they are different uh, in terms of how the proportions split. So with malware, we see a larger percentage of compromised domains. And with phishing, we see a smaller amount, but still a, a decent proportion, around 30%. Uh, being compromised as opposed to maliciously registered. Um, with malware, it's, it ranges quite a bit, but it's between about 57 to 85% over this reporting period. Okay, uh, so in summary, to wrap up, uh, granularity matters. So let's uh, be quite specific about what we're talking about in terms of the type of harm, the type of mitigation that might be appropriate. Um, I think that's a really helpful way to get around the sort of discussions about what is and is not DNS abuse if we get quite specific about what we're talking about. Um, reporting, we hope that we've made this easier. NetBeacon is up, it's functioning, it's running. We have um, a bunch of things that we want to do with that, uh, but we're hearing really great things already in terms of how registrars are receiving those reports. We're really keen to raise awareness about this and drive traffic for people to use that as the go-to place for reporting. Compass is also up and running. We release reports every month. You can access the data um, online. We also publish a PDF where we give a little bit more commentary. Um, and get in contact. Uh, the Institute, you know, one of our pillars is collaboration and we will talk to anybody who is genuinely interested at tackling this issue. So we'd, we'd love to hear from you. The contact form on our website um, just reach out and uh, either myself or, or Graham will will respond and we'll have a chat All right I might leave it there and see if we have any questions
hoping that there was sound through that. Hi, Rowena, it's Adam from uh, the IGF in Addis. And Thank yes, we have, we have one question. So I will give the microphone to the gentleman. Please say your name and ask your question. Here's the mic. Um, my name is Jess Allen, for the record. Um, I have questions about the, the, the mechanisms that you use to collect the Dennis abuse uh, data. Uh, 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 that's one question. I, I would like you to expand on that a bit. And the second question is um, the quality, I mean, the, the specific format the data is available. Is, do, you, do you publish the data for public access so that people can repurpose the data? Particularly, is it available in machine readable form? So that is the second question. And then uh, my third question is about privacy related matters. Yeah, in, so you collect the data and then what uh, sort of mechanism do you use to make the data anonymous so that um, your approach will a little bit become privacy preserving? Um, these are the three questions I would like you to answer. Thank you. Thank you, Joanne, um, for those questions. That's, that's a really great selection. So um, something around the methodology, uh, the format of the data, and then also privacy. So uh, to give you a bit more context, the way that the methodology works is we, well, when I say we, I mean core labs out of uh, Grenoble University, um, ingest a number of existing uh, threat feeds or reputation block lists um, from sources that provide these lists either for fairly low or no cost um, so there's a list of those in our methodology those uh, lists are then ingested and then go through essentially a filter where core labs uh, does certain things so one of those things is that they remove what we call special domains special domains are things like um, something like Google Docs, which would be very inappropriate to act at the DNS level if there were issues. Um, one of the other things they do is take screenshots so that there's evidence. Um, and they also take something that is kind of like a digital fingerprint of a variety of attributes related to the domain name at that point in time. So it's that digital fingerprint that goes, that is checked um, at those intervals to see if mitigation has happened. And that feeds into the determination of whether the domain name is malicious or compromised. In terms of uh, the format of the data, so we uh, provide those charts. Those charts are interactive. Um, we don't provide the underlying domain names to everyone. If people are interested in, in seeing those, they could approach the threat feed providers and we, we list out who they are. Um, and that's something that registries and registrars can do if they are interested in, in receiving those domain names which they can then investigate and consider whether action is appropriate within their remit of control in terms of uh, the privacy question so the, there isn't any personal data collected in this project so we we don't have to anonymize that because we don't collect personal data i hope that answers all three if not let me know R Rowena, no, we have. Questions. I was just going to say we have nodding in the room, so thank you. That answer's great. And yeah, <laughs> I suppose any questions online for Rowena? Thank you, Ro Rowena. It's very interesting. Thanks. Thank you. And thanks, everyone, for bearing with us through a few um, technical issues. Okay, thanks. We'll end the session and see you soon. Wonderful. Cheers. Wonderful. Thanks, everyone. Have a good
Recording in progress.